get into the theater and the usher nods me in. They know me here. I descend down the staircase behind the movie screen that only select people know about. The door at the bottom opens and I walk in. The sound of movie spoilers fill the air. The barkeep has my drink ready and motions me to the back. The rest of the crew are here already. This is my type of place and these are my type of people. Join me as we discuss the inner secrets of cinema. Have a seat in the spoiler room. Yes, folks, it's yet another episode of uh, kind of impromptu invites, and I managed to grab a crew member to sit and talk to me tonight about a film that came out this past weekend that is causing a stir among a lot of people. And I am talking about The Happy Time Murders. And to talk about this film that has sex, murder, and puppets in it is none other than the lovely Andrew Shearer. Hello, Andrew. So glad you could join us tonight to talk about this film. (laughs) Hi. Well, sex, murder, and puppets are... Some of my favorite stuff in movies. So (laughs) this movie was kind of like, I wouldn't say made for me necessarily. Okay, I will say. Yeah, I can actually don't know who it was made for if not for someone like me. (laughs) Well, and you're a you're a huge uh, uh, puppet fan, Muppet fan in general, though. I mean, you you are like an encyclopedia knowledge on this stuff and, and you really follow it closely, don't you? I wouldn't say I have like an encyclopedic knowledge of uh, stuff like the Muppets or Jim Henson things, but I, I do have like a background from pretty much the time I was born uh, as a as a fan of Muppets. I think mostly that's because of the generation that I'm from. Mm-hmm. Um, the Muppets were family entertainment for a long time because in the late 70s, early 80s, was bef- it was before Disney had their big renaissance. And so... Muppets were like one of the top names in family entertainment around that time. And definitely the only name as far as puppetry was concerned. And they are credited with having uh, kept puppetry relevant um, as you know, in in modern times and definitely in the entertainment industry, what they did um, was basically unparalleled, not just in terms of like uh, cultural visibility, but as, as the art form itself, um, all the things that they did um, were just like, like, you know, no one's ever done that any, anything comparable with it since in terms of physical effects. Yeah. Not, not done as well as they have had a history of, and they just keep getting better. I mean, there was that void that needed to be filled because Disney was on the ropes. I mean, they were out looking for anything, including making more mature films like the black hole. <laughs> and was it uh, something the wicked this way comes too? they were behind. Um, I think it was, uh, but you know, so yeah, the Muppets, I remember growing up with the Muppets. I mean, they were the thing. I mean, you, you, when you were really young, you saw them on Sesame street and then, you know, you had the Muppet show, which I watched like religiously. And then the Muppet movies, you know, I went to, I went to those when I was young and I remember, uh, the Jim Henson hour. And actually this kind of relates to the film we're going to talk about tonight. I, I remember them doing the Jim Henson hour. Uh, and that was amazing. That uh, lion puppet that they had in the beginning, opening of that show. Did you ever watch that? I did, and um, Storyteller as well. Mm -hmm. Um, There were a lot of things that um, they were trying to do to branch out from. I don't think they ever wanted to be strictly known as a family entertainment company. And specifically the Jim Henson Creature Shop, I don't think the intention was ever to be like, all we do is things for children's movies, period. I don't think that was ever the case. Jim Henson himself probably could never have gone too far outside of family entertainment just because he was so synonymous with children's television and, you know, uh, puppetry, which is seen as a, you know, an art form for children. So he personally could never have his name, I think, on anything that got too far outside the lines. But I don't think his ever goal was just strictly making things that were like warm, fuzzy, cute, designed to you know for preschool kids and stuff. Well, no, you just look at lab, look at Labyrinth and Dark Crystal. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, those that puppetry. Geez, well, at least Dark Crystal for sure. You know, it's like I still remember all the puppets in that uh, in that movie, and I love that movie so much. Uh, but 
Those are the family-friendly ones, but here now we have Brian Henson directing a more mature Muppet movie, if you will. Uh, the Happy Time Murders. Did you want to give the synopsis of the story? Absolutely. The Happy Time Murders is takes place in an alternate reality of Los Angeles where humans and puppets coexist in the city together, but the puppets are marginalized and discriminated against because they're not seen as human, and therein lies a conflict. The, center, the story centers on a puppet character named Phil, who is a private detective, and he was once like actually a police detective, and he was involved in an incident with his partner, played by Melissa McCarthy, and this not only haunts him, but has had an effect on law enforcement because he was the first puppet cop ever. And he uh, screwed that up pretty badly. And so when the uh, when a series of puppet murders start happening, he uh, he gets on the case and has to work with her in order to solve it. Yeah, and uh I'm going to say right now what surprised me because I didn't go into it knowing much outside of some of the trailers. I'm like, okay, this is going to be kind of a ha ha raunchy comedy. And then looking at, it, I'm like watching the film. I'm like, Oh wait, no, we're taking a noir approach to this film. I'm like, okay, you've got me hooked. Cause I'm a sucker for noir. Uh, you know, given what we saw with the trailers and that, did that kind of a, uh, was that a bit unexpected Andrew with the, the approach that they kind of took with the story compared to what we were getting in the trailers? Well, STX Entertainment deserves a lot of credit for having bankrolled a movie like this because mm -hmm. from what I know, it took them 10 years to get it made because no one could put up the amount of money that it would take to do this right. And um, STX, while commendable, um, their marketing for it assumed that people had never heard of like adult-oriented puppetry. Right. That like... Anything from, uh, like, you know, Meet the Feebles is very obscure, and maybe, like, nobody remembers Crank Yankers from Comedy Central. Oh, but God, yes. The Tony, multi Tony winning Broadway show Avenue Q, which also has puppets and humans, you know, I think they just assumed that nobody knew what that was either. So they sell this film on just like, hey, puppets are being dirty, and the movie is like so much more than that that I don't think anybody that went to see it was necessarily there for anything but make me laugh, gross puppets. Yeah, I, I think so too. I don't think people actually were expecting it pretty much straight up. I mean, there is humor injected in it, but at its core, it's straight up uh, old school noir storyline, you know, with your PI, uh, disgraced detective, his partner, uh, him, you know, having connections in the underbelly of of the world, which happens in this case to be populated mostly by puppets, because as Andrew said, they're considered second class citizens. So I think uh, that might shock some people right away is, is how this film starts out. And, you know, I liked it. I, I liked how it started out, but the whole film, I actually enjoyed the approach. Uh, in fact, I think it works better when there weren't exactly all the, uh, though I did laugh, some of the forced humor in here. Uh, you know, how would you think? How would you think it would play out if they didn't put quite as much of the standard? Uh, well, not standard, but the little bit more fo forced kind of blatant jokes that they had in here. Uh, how would you feel? But do you think it would have worked better for maybe people, or do you think it would have worked worse for people who are already hating it? Um, no one was gonna like this movie. It's mm -hmm. too out there. This is not the kind of thing that um, was going to be uh, embraced. This is not a thing that was going to be understood. It's the first really of its kind. You you could compare it in story wise to something like Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and you could compare it, uh, you know, humor wise or uh, concept wise to some of that other stuff that I mentioned. But in terms of like a wide release film. In this century, there's no precedent for this. It wasn't ever going to be great. It's just like, it just had to have the audacity to exist. And right. so, therefore, I, there is no way you could have made this film 
without it having been based on something people already were familiar with uh, and have it be uh, something that people liked. They just weren't. What I'm blown away by is not necessarily like, oh, look, you know, the humor. Or, oh, I'm blown away by the fact that it exists. From the moment I saw the trailer, I was like, this is going to sink like a stone. But I'm happy about the fact that it is made. I don't see how anyone thought this would be something that people would like. You couldn't take out the humor because this concept is ridiculous and it's being made by people that have experience with, I mean, Brian Henson has done adult oriented puppet shows at the Aspen comedy festival from what Mm -hmm. I've interviews that I've seen and stuff. And a lot of this humor comes from that. A lot of the humor is also very Muppety while adult in nature, as far as like the content goes and the delivery, the feel of it, you know, the, the, the way that the humor plays out, some of those tags at the ends of scenes and things like that is very, very Muppety. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know if that's jarring for people or what, but if you just played it straight, they would still say it was terrible and stupid. You've got to do comedy as a bridge between concept and content. You mm-hmm. have to. Because if you don't have the film laughing or asking you to laugh, people are going to laugh at it no matter what. So the old additive, uh, you know, if they're going to laugh at you, give them a reason to laugh. Don't just make them, you know, look for a reason to laugh at you. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. But I mean, this is, this is a bridge kind of a movie. mm -hmm. This is, you know, the Henson legacy is puppetry. That's it. That's puppetry relevant in modern time. That's all they're trying to do. If you look at something like the Muppet show, if they just came out with the, the Muppet show like tomorrow and it had never existed before, the reviews would be awful and it would be dead in the water after a few shows too expensive and people don't get it. It's like kids don't think it's funny and adults um, are not amused by it and are too like highbrow. It could have only happened when it did, you know? And um, I think the scariest question to ask is, should this have been done? I think so. I mean, why not? You know, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm one of those, especially for something like this, um, in a world where we've got so much, you know, just CGI fest here, they, you know, they're using technology with the green screen and that, but the puppetry in this was amazing. I mean, Phil Phillips, uh, which I love the name, um, our detective, we get to see him like actually walk. You know, like full body walking, it's not always just from the waist up or whatever of him bobbing. You you get to see scenes like that, but other Muppets as well. Uh, you, you see them walking, you see how they're interacting with live action things to where it's just, it, it's the artistry alone for the puppetry. It, it's great, you know, and I I don't see why not make a film like this and make it adult. I I... You know, people going into it going, oh, this is dumb, this is stupid. I'm like, yet we have films like Sausage Party, which was completely, you know, you, you know, we, we, we had comedies like that. Yet this one is just, you know, 26% on, on Rotten Tomatoes. And, and people are saying it's the dumbest movie ever. I'm like, I'm not sure what movie they watched because what I saw was, a really cool film involving uh, some talent and the fact that the human actors in that as well sold it, which helps. I think you need that. You know, that that's what made like the original Muppet movie work was the fact that, you know, people bought the, the actors really sold the fact that these Muppets are here and treated them like they were actually creatures existing in this universe rather than they're just looking at someone, you know, with, with a, uh, with a Muppet on their hand or whatnot, you know? So I think the humans help sell this idea, but yeah, no, I think it should be made like this, something made like this. Cause uh, who else is going to do it? Well, you know? I, I, I agree, but I think uh, cable is the way to go with something this experimental. Um, definitely because of comedy on the big screen right now is dead. I wouldn't say it's dead, but it is really dying. Yeah. You know, there are very few successful comedies made anymore in terms of like, you know, wide release. And so to go like, not only are we going to make a wide release comedy, but we're going to make it with puppets and Melissa McCarthy, who people kind of hate. 
you know, I hate to say it, but they do. They're like, she's, she's saturated, you know? Um, yeah. She, she, she has kind of, cause she's been in like so many comedies in all honesty. It's kind of the Will Ferrell effect. Yes. And played similar characters to this. Yeah. And, and she's played it before. So, I mean, we've seen her in, in roles like this before, but I, you know, she wasn't full on Melissa McCarthy in this. I thought she did well in this, you know, really well. And, and it kind of hinges on her selling the fact that, you know, it, these Muppets are all, actually all the way are, you know, are there um, because she has the most interaction with them. I mean, I personally enjoyed quite a bit, the whole story, the whole bit when they uh, go see uh the one uh, gangster, the one guy who was a happy time murder member who now he's, he's running. Uh, Lyle. Uh, huh? Lyle. Lyle. You know, when they go see, see him, I love that whole bit. <laughs> The old snorting, snorting sugar, and and that I just I enjoyed that. I don't know why, but that made me chuckle and smile, uh, you know, a lot. And especially how that plays out later on, where she's <laughs> she's talking to the the Russian uh, uh, bulldog of uh, you know how he treats his women. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, Which, it was it was great because uh, the joke in there. They're like, oh, you know, she's got a puppet liver or whatever. You laugh at that. Like, yeah. you don't think she's really got one, but then you find out she does, you know, later on. And holy crap, you find out she's also, because of it, she's, like, addicted to syrup. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they are, like, throwing everything into this, you know? I mean, it's not just, like, they they did not play anything safe here. And, no. and I, I, I love that you know it doesn't every joke does not have to land and who says it has to you know when you're dealing with experimental comedy which is exactly what happy time murders is it is not about humor it's about comedy and i know that sounds crazy but to me there's a distinction between things that are going to make you laugh and things and and just comedy period Comedy is about so much more than did they, did you laugh at it? I've seen great comedies that did not make me laugh. I am looking for, you know, I'm looking for them going for the joke. Well, no matter what the joke is, go for it and be original. And I, I feel like this was a really go for it kind of movie. And I always respect it. Did you like, do you laugh at Andy Kaufman and stuff like that? You know, like, not always. That's, but, I mean, but nobody but... thinks he's not a genius. You know, well, some people do, but you know what I mean. I, I think we don't know. We, we, we're not. We can't immediately say that's. I think part of the problem is that people want to make a judgment immediately. They want to have opinion immediately. They want like the gavel to fall on entertainment immediately, and it's just not the way art works. You know. No, it, it isn't, and, and I think you could say the same. You know, with comedy. As you do horror in many ways, um, it, the way I've looked at it over the years is I've tried to make a bit of the distinction because, like you said, there's things that make you laugh and then there's comedy. For me, I think there's things that are horror and then there's the jump scares that will automatically get you the reaction. Mm, you know, it's the same. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, and I, I the same way. Yeah. And the comedy in here, I mean. Yeah, not all the jokes land, but you're just like, wow, they they went there. Like, you know, when Phil Phillips, he starts his investigation and he goes, visits the porn shop. Yes. <laughs> and, and you got the Rastafarian man uh, uh, come out from behind, uh, you know, the back room and the curtains open. <laughs> 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 and, and there's an octopus milking a cow. It's gross. <laughs> video camera there and i'm just like wow <laughs> right, right and you ask the question like who is this for like who who is the target audience i don't think that was the thought here no i mean they, they really were just like behind this weird ass idea and you know what's wild about that scene and that scene they are because the whole thing is like there's a there's a, a show called happy time something or other it's an old like hit show that's now the Happy Time Gang. The Happy Time and Gang. The yeah. people that are the the pu puppets that are being bumped off were all cast members of this show, the Happy Time Gang, because there's this dispute about royalties and stuff. And I think like you know if the rest of them die, 
or whoever dies, they the other people get more. And get so more money, mur- yeah. Yeah, someone's murdering them all, and they suspect people from the cast. Um, one of the cast members, and they're all at this point kind of down and out. Because, yeah. <laughs> for various reasons. They're, none of them are, like, super successful. And the character they're looking for in there is this rabbit. Uh, Mr. Bubbles. Bumble <laughs> Pants. Mr. Bumble. Bumble. Bumbly Pants. Bumbly Pants, yeah. And the act, the person who plays Mr. Bumbly Pants, the rabbit, who's a, you know, raincoat and everything, this rabbit, it's Kevin Clash that is the fallen, the fallen puppet star that made his name, uh, uh turning Elmo into like a, an icon in, in children's entertainment. Yeah. And as we all know, Kevin Clash was later, decades later, scandalized. Mm hmm. And I saw his name in the credits, and I was like, "Holy crap!" Kevin Clash was Lyle, and Kevin Clash was Bumbly Pants. You know <laughs> how wild? Just there's things about this movie. It just it touches so many of the. It, it's really going for the edges. Yeah. I don't think it's aimed for the middle, which is where mainstream audiences, you know, will make something successful. You got to hit that middle, and it isn't even thinking about. No, that. no, there's there's. <laughs> No, that that's why you know the whole time I'm watching it, I'm smiling and I'm enjoying it, you know, uh, for what it is. But I'm just sitting there going, I'm watching a film like this on a wide release. How did they? You yeah. know, I mean, I'm just I'm like, who's tax write off with this? <laughs> you know, because when Phil in that same porn job, after we get the milk seed, which at first didn't land with the audience when we saw it. And then it just keeps going in the background as they're having a discussion and it keeps going. And suddenly people are starting to find it funny and they're laughing by the end of it because of how ridiculous it and how it ends. So to speak. Yeah. And and you, what you realize with that dude is like some people think they're beating a joke into the ground, but that is not beating a joke into the ground. Lots of mainstream comedies, R rated comedies beat jokes into the ground. Because that's their style. That's what they have to do. You know that from that yeah. vacation movie you like so much. <laughs> they just kick those jokes until they're dead because they think that's funny and excessive. That's not, I think, what Happy Time Murders is doing. What people say it is because they're tr- they say they're trying too hard. That's not true. Those jokes need to go past you a couple times because the first couple times it's like, all right, if this was a comedy with no puppets, I would pick that up. But because yeah. it's puppets, I'm like, oh. God, there's puppet. You know what I mean? So you're, you're tripped up on that the first time. So them driving at home, but the best example of that, and I've seen them they laugh my head off, in an empty theater I'm laughing my head off, is um, um, McCarthy's character has just done like a lot of this puppet drug that's basically like <laughs> super crazy sugar that only puppets can handle. She's been, you know, doing the cop thing. She's channeling, uh, you know, bad lieutenant or whatever. Yeah. She's just like super high. And the, the chief comes over to interview Phil and uh uh edwards yes um about uh you know what they gathered from being at this puppet den or whatever and lyle is murdered and uh she keeps repeating the same thing over and over again the same conclusion that they've reached and you're going like okay we get it it's funny and you're like okay stop okay why does she keep saying it's not funny but then the tag at the very end she says it one last time and phil just mumbles like what the fuck (laughs) <laughs> it, killed me. it killed me that tag you know the film is aware of how ridiculous it is but it is still trying to function as a these people are not brand new at making puppet movies dude no. that's what we got to remember here give them the benefit of the doubt this is brian henson you know this guy is a master been a master for a very long time and the guy playing phil phillips this bill beretta this is like Rolf the dog dr teeth the, all these people know what they are doing. Like this is still the forefront of puppetry here. Yeah, it's a veteran cast of 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 the Jim Henson Company folks behind this. So I mean, these yeah, nearly all these people. I mean, it's like they've been in the business for years. They know what they're doing, and you could tell too, just the way the puppets are handled and everything. You know, they great. And, oh, they they looked awesome. I mean, especially uh. Who is that? Um, uh, the 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 uh, the lady uh, who who ends up hiring Phil because she's getting threatened. Um, crap, what's her name now? Uh, totally forgot. Uh, the one he he ends up having sex with. 
<laughs> oh, oh, I don't know. I can't, I can't remember her name, but she figures into the story really, really heavily in a Chinatown like twist. <laughs> yeah, which I, I didn't expect at all. I'm like, oh, wow, okay. Oops, we... it was good, wasn't it? Oops, they wrote a good story after all. I'm sorry. They, they did. <laughs> they did write a great story. I, uh, I could believe they they went there. It's like, wow, this is a true like all in story with her twist of of yeah. you know being who she was it's like wow all right a little they, bit of crying game a little bit basic instinct <laughs> the, the little basic instinct scene you know i mean you get stuff like that too where uh it, she did it and the thing is it, folks they do this interview scene with this uh and I, i'm trying to remember her name i do apologize uh there are a lot of characters in this film uh and she uh was it her name sandra I think. Uh, I'm so, totally. I'm surprised I remember as much as I do. No, I saw it a few days I, ago. Yeah, my, it, it, I, I saw it a few days ago too, so I apologize uh, with my uh, brain slipping. But and and I'm getting old. But anyway, she's getting interviewed, and Phil and Edwards are looking through the one way mirror as she's getting interviewed, and she does the leg crossing scene, and and you can see right up the right up the dress, just like in Basic Instinct, and you see she has has purple hair. And at first you're like, okay, that was just kind of a blatant basic instinct joke. But the way they wrote this, I thought was actually kind of clever because that actually, even though it seemed like a blatant parody joke, works into the plot as a major reveal later on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and that actually surprised me. I'm like, wow, they, they actually gave it some purpose, which... A number of modern comedies, uh, I, I will go out there and say, don't do that with their jokes. Their jokes are there blatantly for just the ha or whatever, the shock, and they move on. And you're like, okay, what was the real purpose of that or you know, whatever purpose of that scene? And in here, most of the stuff kind of had a purpose to it. <laughs> you know, although I don't know if the uh, fireman being whipped by a Dalmatian puppet <laughs> served much of the plot, but I kind of dug the uh, role reversal on that. Well, that, well that, was, that was early in the film, and you're just trying to get audiences, you know, like used to like this atmosphere of you're going to see anything. We will do anything. And it, it pumps the brakes on that kind of stuff after a while, but you got to get a lot, give people a lot of that stuff up front because. Um, the shock of the movie is for most people who grew up on puppets as being solely for children. And that is mostly everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, you gotta, you gotta give them some time to get used to the fact that, you know, this is what they're seeing. So you give them a lot of that crazy crap up first and then you start to dish the story and the character out. Yeah. It, it does, it does, uh, it does take a turn and, and you don't get quite as much of the blatant humor later on now that you mention it because uh we actually get that uh one of the first I, what i consider is, is probably one of those points where it does take a little bit more of a serious turn is when phil is meeting with his brother uh -huh. and they're having that discussion about his his fandom and that's where we learn about the happy time show and i loved that whole scene dealing with the fan showing up and how they talk about how he changed his nose and he lightened and, his skin Tried to look more human. Yeah, I'm like sitting here going, wow, they're saying a lot in this one scene. Yeah, that was like a very clear Michael Jackson reference <laughs> for one thing. Oh, yeah, the, the lighting of the skin and the name. Yeah, you know, the, the but then, and... then later, you know, Phil many times uh, calls people racist for, you know, discriminating against him or mar marginalizing puppets. And people do it. They treat them horribly. And, you know, at, at first I was going like, all right, no, you know, too much. You got y'all are trying to do too much. Like, yeah, just just do some story. You don't have to throw in the whole puppets racism thing. You know what I mean? But later, I arrived at this conclusion after I, you know, because I was thinking about this movie for a couple of days, and uh, I didn't have it in my notes or anything. But later, I was thinking, you know, it's like um, puppetry is marginalized. Puppetry is discriminated against. Mm -hmm. There is a very set space in the entertainment culture for them and 
and they are not allowed to go outside of that. And if they are, they are, that is not for mass consumption. Puppetry for, you know, that is, that is out there distributed for mass consumption cannot, will not be accepted, um, doing anything except for children's stuff. And that mm-hmm. is evidenced by, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Muppets CBS series that seem to be hated by basically everyone. Uh, and that is definitely evidenced by this as well. People don't want it to succeed. They would rather them stay in their place. And when I started thinking about that and the, the fact that they weren't addressing necessarily race at all, they were using that as a metaphor for the way that puppetry as an art form is treated by, uh, by the entertainment industry. I was like, I gotcha. Whether or not you intended that, that's the signal I picked up on later. And I'm like, I feel you, man. That's, that's pretty cool. You watch it with that on your mind or think back to it with that on your mind. I, it wouldn't surprise me if, if Henson was thinking about that. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt it either that they're giant, giving a bit of a jab. I mean, um, uh, you know, with that, that's what I started to get the message on it as well, because this isn't the first time we've tried to do a, a, you know, in recent years, a, a different puppet movie. I mean, it wasn't completely puppets, I don't think, but uh, you had Mirror Mask, which failed horribly uh, a number of years ago, was it 2005, I think, that came out. You know, Henson's crew, they weren't, they did the puppetry and stuff for that, and that didn't go over well, and even though it was PG, it was still a darker type story because it was Neil Gaiman, yeah. and, you know, we, we've had a few other puppet things come out that just people can't get past the idea of puppets doing more mature things but then you had avenue q which was very successful for a long time i don't know if they're still going on but yeah uh, it's off broadway well i think yeah i think it's off broadway at this point but it it ran for like if not 20 years close to it you know but very successful but again there are things that a theater audience will accept that is way different from you know. I don't even think there was any. I would I would be surprised if anybody got anywhere with a film adaptation of Avenue Q. I don't think anyone would bankroll that. No, not not for a wide consumption. Maybe a, dir- a VOD or a uh. direct to video thing, which, like you said, maybe had they done that with this, uh, it would have been a a little bit accepted better. <laughs> Though I don't think they'd be getting to as many people as they want. Uh, I think it would have probably been a little bit more accepted because people, as uh, I've mentioned before, I I truly think people are more forgiving or or accept things a little bit differently when they're direct to video or VOD than when they're wide released. Definitely with comedy, people are way more uh, are way more willing to take a chance on comedy when it is television. Um, because they'll give it a couple of episodes, you know what I'm saying? Or they'll give it a season sometime or half a season. They'll, they will, the whole thing about TV is there's a tolerance for concept to be developed. You know, a lot of people are like, all right, well, we're going to stick with it. We're going to see where this goes because that's television's history. It develops, it builds. But for film, I'm telling you, and especially now people are just like, give me the sizzle, the steak and let me out of here. That's it. <laughs> no. Yeah, what what are you giving me this alternative thing for? I absolutely no. They're so, they're just not accepting that, you know, and it's gets getting and getting more and more narrow. You know, and we are we are trying to drag people out with some of this entertainment that we've gotten. And um the way we've had to do it really is to just like wedge ourselves in there, you know. Uh Black Panther's a great example. Established mm-hmm. genre superheroes established brand marvel there now we've got it but there is no (laughs) with puppets the muppet is the closest thing and that's generations removed kids are not watching muppets Mm -mm. you know what i'm saying it's just not happening the fan base for muppets dude they're old like us they don't want this you know what i mean and that's evidenced by i hate to keep referencing that ABC series they try to do, which was like a prime time ish thing, go back to the roots of Muppets that were not necessarily aimed at children, but aimed for, you know, mm-hmm. you know, a little bit more sophisticated comedy tastes or whatever. Um, 
people, the Muppets fans mostly in mass hated that, but I loved it. Oh, it broke my heart when it was canceled. It was the only reason I had uh, Hulu, you know, <laughs> loved it. Yeah, it, it was a great show. I enjoyed it quite a bit too. And, and it surprised me that it was canceled. I'm like, wait, they canceled that already. I'm like, what the hell? Uh, people want, people want their idea of the Muppets, which has more to do with Sesame street than the Muppet show. Yeah. It's because that's the thing that was seen the most Sesame street. Mm-hmm. I think people now, I mean, where, where can you watch the original old Muppet show? It's not on Netflix. Is you it on can, Hulu? Uh, I, don't think it's on Hulu. I don't think it, it is might either. be on Amazon, but it might not even be there unless you get the DVDs or whatnot. I don't even think. Yeah, and they only did the first three seasons on DVD too, and they're out of print. I just don't. I think. I think people are really just have no no clue, no concept, and their memory of it is tainted by. Oh, this is something I watched as childhood. They're not going to accept this. You know, they never were gonna. I don't think. But, but even the show, the Muppet Move, you know, the Muppet Show. If you go back and look. At some of the things they did, at some of the jokes they had, and, and some of the character, you know, what was going on, you're like, this wasn't just geared towards kids. Well, no, Sesame I mean, Street was for the children. Right. But, so I mean, but, but, I mean, many people consider The Muppet Show. Is, it goes along with what you're saying is, is their expectation or whatnot. You know, look at The Muppet Show as being... But if you look at that, people hear, uh, you know, see criticism of, oh, they're blowing away puppets, which I thought was hilarious that they actually left them with stuffing. It wasn't red stuffing. It was when the puppets get killed in here, they have stuffing. It, it, it's just the simple, straight up like they're regular Muppets, which I, I was happy about. I was thought maybe they do some kind of fake, you know, red stuffing or something. But no, no, it's, and that, that's a, it's a good point to bring up because, you know, j- Brian Henson is not going to do anything that's going to tarnish the the Henson name. Right. He's not. And I think going meet the feebles with it, with gore, um, it betrays like a very fundamental thing. But it also says that this movie is not trying to shock people. Mm-hmm. That's not the idea of it. It's a movie. It's just a movie. It's just really high concept. But that's kind of the game they were always in. You know, the very idea of a puppet variety primetime series is high concept. <laughs> they, that high concept is their game. You know, think about the Dark Crystal. Oh, man, that was an all yeah. puppet fantasy. Like, it amazes me that was even made. You know what I mean? And not I only mean, fantasy, but it's dark fantasy. I mean, there's some themes going yes. on in there and stuff that happens that you're just sitting there going, holy crap. And you forget you're watching Muppets. You're into these characters, the way they handle that film. And it's a, such a beautiful, dark movie that's yes. got disturbing imagery. But that's the film they're making. Who says yeah. you can't use Muppets to tell a, a regular story like that? Why, yeah. and, and why I, I regulate them to children, you know? It's true, dude. And by the end of Happy Time Murders, where they're like, you know, going through the the uh, the building or whatever together, and it's Phil and McCarthy, puppet and human together, the way it's shot, the way the music is, the way their performances are, you do lose yourself in it. I don't care who you are. You're not sitting there going like, this sucks. It becomes like a real-ass cop police movie by that point. I... I really felt that way when I was watching it. Oh, what, yeah, what, especially when they go find the last two uh, surviving members yeah. of the gang after everybody gets killed, and they're in the car, <laughs> and they have that scene where it's played the music, and feels like, what, what are you listening to? And, and she ends up pulling out the gun and shoots the console, and they have a yeah. moment where they laugh and everything. You're like, oh, wait a minute, she's talking to a puppet. You forget that Phil is a puppet after a while in this you film. Do. You do. And that Bill Barrett is so good. And um, there's a scene where they come upon uh, the, like the inbred children. <laughs> these little puppets. <laughs> that was, that was Amazing. Crazy. I know. They came in, he busted that room because they thought someone was, a girl was screaming. And here are two children puppets. It's one like, has one eye. Yeah. What is three eyes? <laughs> and he's just like, oh. <laughs> it's 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 like out of the hills of ice or something. But it's so well played and it makes sense in the story and you're going like, whoa. You know what I mean? <laughs> and you could, you could say that like they threw too much in here. 
but I think really you can't just watch it once and make your mind up. You got to look at like the fact that it even is happening is, is just the headspace is throwing you and it's disorienting. And I think a lot of these bad reviews that have come out, a lot of these like snap judgments about it are really just like you can't, if there was already a bar for a movie like this, it'd be one thing if you could just go ahead and say, well, it's not good. Right. But it's not good compared to what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what scale are you judging this on? You know? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure, you know, I, I, I'm not really sure what people expected going into it because, you know, and, and we talk about Melissa McCarthy, but the rest of the human cast, I thought, did well. I mean, we have Elizabeth Banks show up in here who, yes, was involved in a human puppet relationship, <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, Elizabeth Banks. So way to go, Phil. Uh, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But I loved that angle, and then how she plays into the twist later on. I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> you know, but the one character who I think people kind of miss in this film that I loved was uh, Maya Rudolph's Bubbles. Gosh, she was so great, right? Oh, my God. She was hilarious and so just perfect the way she plays that character, you know. And and she even David gave her something to do at first to where she wasn't just the secretary behind the desk. But you get that scene, uh, it, it, yeah. The uh, the uh, woman uh, who who hires Phil as a, a PI to investigate the threats. Her name was Sandra. There's a scene which will make you not look at silly string the same way ever again. Uh, there's a scene with Phil and Sandra going at it. And the cops come in and, and everybody's kind of waiting for them to be done. And as Phil hits the happy moment, she just casually pulls out a spray bottle and rag. And for some reason, I was just rolling at the way she did that. But, you know, she does a lot of things in this film. She picks picks locks. Uh, you know, she helps uh, Edwards do an investigation. I mean, I really dug her role in this. And at, when in the beginning of the film, I wasn't quite sure, you know, what they were going to do with her character. But I was surprised of how they ended the film with her character. But it fit within the noir genre. It did. You know? Yeah, it did. And as a fan of that stuff, I'm sure you dug not only the way that she was, the way that she played it, which is exactly out of one of those movies, but uh, the way that it ended as well, tied it all up with her relationship with him, just was just I, f- I felt note perfect for that particular genre. Oh, I was I was hoping that's the the angle they would go with it, you know, with her because it's like that's that's your classic, you know, hard boiled noir. Hey, you know, she's right under your nose type of thing. You yeah. Know? <laughs> but yeah, I like I liked her character and uh, yeah, this film. You've got no comparison, and maybe that's what people have an issue with: is they're trying to compare it to other comedies and other things, and maybe some of the gratuitous, uh, you know, the grosswood humor you have in here, you can. But overall, the way this film plays out and how they approach it, there really isn't a precedent for it. No, no, there's not, and you can't <laughs> use like preset like benchmarks to measure something that's you know that's this out there. you just it's not fair to the art it's not fair to what they're what's going on and really it's like not fair to any of the people involved either it's melissa mccarthy's lowest opening weekend of her career and i i think that uh considering how much money was involved how much money she was paid what i don't want to see is people going like I regret doing it or, you know, that's a bad movie or something like that. I don't want that to be the legacy of this thing. I want people to be behind the fact that someone did this in an area where there's no wiggle room for being uh, out there in terms of mainstream entertainment. It is not there anymore. You do not get that chance. Look at the list of movies released. If it's not a franchise, if it's not a sequel, if it's not an adaptation of something that's like something else that it came out, it's just not embraced if it exists at all. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're lucky if you break even with some of those films, 
mm-hmm. if it's not part of an already established names. It's why, as much as we don't like Cena, we see so many reboots, remakes, sequels, you know, <laughs> because it's an established form and your m- mainstream movie audience, that's what they're paying the bucks for. Yeah, yeah. So, like I said, I can't believe they did this. Um, but I'm happy about it as a fan of the Muppets, as a fan of puppetry, as someone who supports uh, Henson family and, and definitely wants to see their legacy continue in order for any of it to like change and grow. You can't just sort of like caretake this thing that your dad did. You know, I don't know anyone who just wants to be, you know, if they own like a family business or something like that, who wants to be under that? What artist yeah. wants to be like that? You know, I saw this great interview with Brian. And the interviewer asked him, among many other really hysterically funny questions, um, they're like, what would your dad say? And that's, I think, what everybody kind of wants to know that realizes who made this. Right. What would Jim, what would Jim Henson think? Not Reverend Pastor Henson. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Henson. And uh, he just said, you know, he would probably think I was a little crazy for doing it, but he, uh, he would be jealous of me. And he would say, you know, I would love to do something like that, but there's no way I could. And that's true. But this guy is not his dad. No. And he's got room to do it. And I'm really like, I really respect him for giving it a shot. You know? I Yeah, I give him respect for giving it a shot. I appreciate the sheer volume of work that had to go into this. I mean, yes. cripes, that scene where we mentioned it was in Lyle's Den. There's like at least 15 puppets in that one damn scene. That's right. And there are people under that stage, which means the human actors are above them. Everything has to be built. You and I have talked about CGI sometimes before. You know, we're in the era where no one appreciates practical effects. Yeah. Puppets are a freaking practical effect. And you look at the reviews for this thing and just like bad movie done. And you're like, oh my God, are you kidding me with that? If you were on the set of this thing, what says bad movie to you? If yeah. you know how it is made, what is bad about that? And one could say, well, look what you did with it. Mm-hmm. Trash. That is so narrow minded, man. It just really, you're not, you're seeing one very small part of this whole picture. I am blown away by what I I find to be still an advancement in puppetry. And if nothing else, it's keeping it alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at least spark some people's interest, I think, still in it. (laughs) Yeah, it's going to have, it's going to, the people I know that liked it, they loved it. You know? Right. Um, yeah, and, but even if you left with your mouth hanging open, <laughs> I'd say, you know, yeah. you're going to remember it. We're talking about it. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, and in my review, I even said I said that, you know, it's not a perfect film by any means, but it was nowhere like what people are painting it. And if you look at the artistry behind it, this film is just it is standalone. You know, it unfortunately may be one of a kind on the big screen i i wish it wouldn't be but it probably is a type of film that i was really happy i got to see it in an audience that there weren't many people in there but the people that were in it we were all laughing yeah we were all having a good time yeah 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 well i think i think what this movie proves and i love it when people put out crazy stuff I said it when I saw Mother, and I'll, you know, I'll, I said it when I saw Only God Forgives, and I'll say it with this too. Movies that are not being talked about in the same conversation as Happy Time Murders, I assure you. But it all it proves that people who say nothing is original anymore, and why is Hollywood so lazy, and why does the movie industry keep doing the same things? When somebody does something radical, they hate it. So there is no credibility to that argument that there's nothing original, nothing new. When someone tries, and I consider this a try, it is and a, a try. great try, um, an audacious effort, 
um, it is it is not only met with like you know disinterest or disdain, but I think people actively want to see it die. They want to see it crash and burn for having that audacity that they claim to want in entertainment. Right. Yeah. I mean, people, it is entertainment, but I, and I think I've mentioned this before. I apologize for repeating myself, but I, you know, people forget film is actually an art form, not just an entertainment form. Uh, you know, oh, and, yeah. You know, I mean, people, I think people kind of forget that. So you get films, like you said, that try to do something different. They're trying to be outside of the norm that you are getting, like you get films like Mother and like this. And, you know, uh, it's, it's one of those things where people are like, oh, well, that's not what I was talking about. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, they still, a mass audience, when you're dealing with paying your star, you know, upwards of 15 to 20 million dollars, when you're talking about marketing, when you're talking about a production itself that is, you know, 50 million dollars to make, you can't mess around. You have to aim for mainstream with that, you know, which is why it blows my mind that anyone thought this should come out. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I, I think it should have been made and I'm happy it was made. I'm so happy it exists. But I'm like, who thought this would succeed? Right. You know, like who? It's it to me just like it it's wild. Uh, and I, I would like to know what that discussion was like, all right, how much do you think this baby's gonna pull down, you know? <laughs> what kind of rave reviews, what kind of <laughs> rabid fan base is this gonna create? God, there's no at no point when I saw that poster, when I saw that trailer, no point did I think this is gonna go over with the mass audience because they aren't there looking for art. They're looking yeah. for familiarity. And yeah, when is- something is unfamiliar territory they just not not like historically but contemporary uh, audiences are not wanting to experiment yeah uh, sorry i didn't mean to jump on you uh you're talking like that i was just gonna say this is something that you would expect to live within the film festival circuit you know the big name ones for a little while which it did and then go direct to video <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know, have a distributor buy it and go okay, and they'll do a, a promotion thing for it. But it would go direct to VOD and all your major streaming, and then eventually to Blu-ray, DVD, and and kind of bypass the widescreen. It live in festival land for a while because that's where you're going to get at least a few more audiences. I think that would appreciate what went into it because festival, on the whole, usually film festival uh, crowds like that, I think are some of them at least are a little bit more uh, open-minded. To yeah, think. they don't, they're not coming to see some Hollywood thing. And, you know, um, this is a probably the best weekend they could have had to put it out, honestly, because you had crazy rich Asians last weekend and you knew that was going to be a big movie. I knew it was going to be a big movie. And uh, so the week after it, it's a great spot to go out. There's really no competition to speak of. A lot of little things coming out, but nothing to really, you know what I mean? If it was going to succeed, it would have succeeded the weekend that it did. It did not. No one's surprised by that. Like bad reviews of it are not surprising. Nothing. I mean, none of that shocked me. The only thing that shocked me was anyone put up the money for it. I'm glad they did. So am I. And, and let's just say that the same people who are shitting on happy time murders are, are, enjoying and loving the hell out of the Meg, which I will still not understand. <laughs> but that's just me. It looked like a lot of other things. Uh, you it, know? It, yeah, it, probably that's the whole reason, but I'm like, uh, uh, leave the big shark movies to Asylum. Uh, so. <laughs> anyway, I think we'll wrap it up here with Happy Time Murders. Uh, I I dug the movie, and actually, it's one of those. The more I think about it, I want to go back and watch it again. Oh, I can't. If they were selling it in the lobby, I would have bought one. Yeah, yeah, same here. You know, because I, I know there's things I probably missed, and after you do get through that first little hurdle of things, and you settle down a little bit, and the film kind of settles into its story, it it's a fun movie. I I really. I'm glad someone made it, though. Uh, yeah, like you said, Andrew, it was not destined for 
for you know big box office yeah but it, you know it just it's a reflection of the times in terms of comedy people just really comedy's just not a big genre right now it's not a money maker it's not wise to make big investments in it because there are very few marquee comedy names and so you know if it's not something like a lego or a kevin hart or something like that it's just you know it's it's just there's a good chance it's not going to do much of anything uh, yeah. and but but for the comedy audience to not be there for something that's out there god a comedy of no other genre other than like science fiction you know should be like willing to you know to be yeah. like to laugh at something that's so sad to me but you know um not unlike comedy you know sci-fi has been diluted so much with the action genre that look at annihilation right oh god One yeah bet, and yet people are like what so i'd i'd blame the marketing a little bit on happy time murders but mostly i blame people it's mostly but it's just not the time you know not not like like not like it is would you say comedy is probably a dying genre of sorts because of the culture that we live in now and i'm not saying it's a bad thing but i'm just saying that that comedy not sure what to do with itself anymore because they're afraid of offending someone out there Um, because you you think of the comedies of the 80s and 90s and yes many of their jokes were inappropriate but at the time especially many people i mean they were they were hilarious films but you go back and look at them going "Oh, oh wow they went there and now most of your jokes are regulated to sex jokes yeah uh, yeah true true no and most of the funniest movies i've seen quite honestly in the last few years um little the little hours i would say probably the funniest like r-rated type movie right but most of the funniest movies i've seen are movies for kids i think like sean the sheep the movie is one of the funniest movies the last 10 years period just that's, that's the way it shook out um i think on the big screen absolutely but in terms of like television theater stand up mm-hmm. it's fine like it's yeah. it's people are you know it's people are laughing at it people are looking for it they're checking it out they need it and it's a lot of really interesting things are happening with it um but in terms of like um hollywood no they, yeah. they, they it is not happening at the moment no i and like it's the few comedies I've seen, the modern comedies, I normally don't go to them because the few I've seen in a couple of recent years really just were like, oh, <laughs> you know, I was like, uh, we here we are, you know, Chips was, I just, oh man, that that one was tough. To yeah, they just they they kind of don't know what to do with it. So anytime somebody does hit on something that works, like Girls Trip, for example, which is hysterically funny, right? They could not put out a Girls Trip too fast enough. You know what I mean? Right. Could not come out fast. As soon as I was at a girl's trip, I was like, God, I want to see them again. You know, <laughs> And we, I'm sure we will. Um, oh, I, I but wouldn't... then, of course, um, you see someone like Tiffany Haddish in absolutely every movie. They did yeah. it with McCarthy after Bridesmaids. You know? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Did you get any trailers before your films? Uh, I think I saw two trailers with her in it beforehand. Um I forgot which ones it was, but uh Night School. Yeah. Night School or Night Class or something like that. With Kevin Hart. Looks great. But yeah, again, but... nothing different about it, let's face it. No. No, it, it looks like it <laughs> follows kind of that normal formula. Nope, it's gonna go down easy. People are gonna love it. <laughs> and but this film <laughs> Actually, I think this film might do better in rental <laughs> when it comes out. Oh, sure. Uh, you know, it's, it's less of a... I just don't... I can't imagine people in mask seeing the trailer for it and going, like, oh, man, Friday night, we are leaving the house. We are going to pay this exorbitant ticket money, and we're going to get that popcorn and candy. We're going to go through all you go through to go to, out to the movies these days and watch this. No, yeah. I can't imagine that conversation transpiring, like you know, for the average film goer. Yeah, yeah, I don't either. Um, oh, that's the other movie I saw the trailer for both Night School and Nobody's Fool, which both had Tiffany Haddish in it before this film. 
Yeah, and that one, the oath, looks really interesting too. But again, you know, she's she's extremely funny, and you could tell the writers of Girl Trip, Girl Trip, liked her the most. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she got most of the greatest job, and so, but that's that's the only way they know what to do: make more of this. You know. Yeah. So. So there you have it, folks. Happy time murders. Uh, hope he gave you a little different perspective than all the uh, the hate that seems to be dripping out there for this film. Uh, destined probably to be a cult film that's going to be visited years later. People are going to look at it, and you know what? It, it might grow in an appreciation uh, later on uh, in, in years. Unfortunately, not now. And I guess we'll just end the night with. Do you see something like this ever happening again, Andrew? Um, no, they are wanting to teach these people a lesson. And that is, don't color too far outside the lines. You know, I, I don't think it's happening. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think so either, at least not on the widescreen. Um, no. You know, um, maybe direct to video or in the indie scene or whatnot. I mean, you did, you've had this in the past. We had Meet the Feebles, which is the most popular one, but uh, an indie filmmaker, Dustin Wade Mills, did the uh, uh, Puppet Massacre, uh, I believe it was called, or uh, something along that lines. That was one of his first films, which basically involved puppets dying and, and, and such. And so <laughs> few and far between do we get films like this, uh, but I have a feeling they'll be explored later on. Yeah, I agree. I, I, don't see us ever getting another film like this. Uh, at least uh, they, they should have like um, CSI Puppet Town. You know, dude, like, that take, would oh, taking an established thing that people at least got some kind of context for, and then throw any of that in there. You know, do one of your cable limited series episode ones where it's a it's a serial, it's a crime drama. Yeah, with with Muppets, I'd see that. I I want to see. Yeah. Unfortunately, I want to see more of the Phil Phillips character. He was fantastic, man. He uh, God, who did he remind you of? What actor did he remind you of? Uh, I'm not. There was sure. something like really specific that I was thinking of when I was watching it. Now, and, and I and I, I I the name popped into my head while I was watching it uh, in the theater. But damn, if I can't think of it now. But he yeah, seemed like of uh, maybe Stacy Keach. Uh, ish, close, <laughs> close, but not quite, and not quite Dan Hedaya either. He was, he was somewhere. He was somewhere there. Maybe it's just because I recently rewatched Blood Simple, but oh, God, he sure. was, he was, he was almost like right on as a, and I'll think of it after we are done recording. I'm sure. <laughs> That's okay. Well, thank you, Andrew, for discussing this uh, with me tonight. Uh, I, there was, there was a lot here, and, and I'm, I'm glad you came on and, and talked this because. Uh, I wanted to give a different perspective to those out there who, who are just seeing nothing but the uh, negativity behind it and going solely by the almighty tomato meter, uh, which, yeah, I've got opinions about, which I'll just keep to myself right now. But we will have the part of the show right now where my guest will tell you about stuff he's working on and where you can find more of his stuff. So, Andrew, go ahead and uh, you've got a license to shill, sir. Oh, hey. Oh, nice. I like what you did there, dude. That's a new one. Uh, hey. uh, I, thank you for asking me to do this. Um, I'm a, you know, diehard Muppet fan from childhood. So I'm always going to have stuff to say about things like this. Um, so I was, thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that. Um, here in Athens, Georgia, my friends and I make movies under the band of Gonzorific, G-O-N-Z-O-R-I-F-F-I-C. So if you want to watch our movies, we get paid on Amazon Prime a whopping six cents an hour. If you watch our movies, um, you can go to amazon.com slash V slash Gonzorific and um, just, you know, watch, watch some of our stuff. Give it a chance. We, we do, we do no budget micro cinema. Um, and uh, maybe you'll laugh at it. Maybe you won't, but just leave it playing all the time. If you don't mind, <laughs> <laughs> just put it on repeat in the background, please, by all means, please do help support that indie cinema folks it it so deserves it so come on you know you want to watch space boobs in space we made space boobs in space with a title like that you can't go wrong between that and dr humpenstein's erotic castle oh Oh, boy yeah oh man see you folks check it out (laughs) 
make sure you check that out, folks. Check out all our stuff on our channel. I've got a Patreon as well in case you're inclined. I'm cheap and easy. Uh, there's always a lot of stuff there as well. So we thank you. And now, uh, yeah, let's just say good night. Good night. Yeah. Hey, all my friends out there looking for more Spoiler Room goodness? Then why don't you check out our brand new Patreon page, patreon.com slash specialmarkproductions, where you can get access to exclusive Spoiler Room episodes and a whole lot more. You can also find us on Facebook groups at SMPRD and on to Twitter at Special Mark Pro. Let your voice be heard and let us know what you would like to see in the Spoiler Room, as well as just how we're doing in general. We appreciate your support, and remember in the Spoiler Room, the conversation is fresh, but we do spoil the movies.